Down for refurbishment are perhaps three of the most dreaded and hated words for guests and fans of theme parks. Uh, even when the parks attempt to theme the announcement, uh, such as when Disney tries to employ their Disney magic, uh, which George uh, J. Bay III argues is a pedagogical tool that allows guests to, quote, uh, exist in a magical state of awareness, or in other words, uh, to, to suspend their disbelief, uh, and ask their guests uh, to pardon their pixie dust, uh, fans are still disappointed with the disruption of their plans within the park. Uh, generally speaking, when an attraction is down for refurbishment, that means that they are going, uh, they are making changes and or improvements to the attraction. Uh, the most common reasons for this downtime is to fix something that is broken, uh, to refresh the aesthetics or appearance of the ride, or to update the technology, the effects, uh, the ride vehicles, or even to replace the track itself. Uh, while the majority of the refurbishments are, are for these reasons, another major but less common reason for these refurbishments is to make changes to the narrative of the attraction. Uh, sometimes these changes are to add new characters into an attraction, uh, such as adding Jack Sparrow into Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, or for a holiday overlay, uh, like how every August the Haunted Mansion in Disneyland closes to add in elements from the Nightmare Before Christmas uh, to become Haunted Mansion Holiday. Uh, an increasingly popular reason to make narrative changes is to ensure the storyline aligns more with the sensibilities of the modern day. Uh, perhaps the most well-known examples of this are the changes Disney announced in the past year to Splash Mountain and the Jungle Cruise uh, to remove the negative racial stereotypes in the rides uh, in response to the Black Lives Matter movement and the associated racial reckoning that erupted in the summer of 2020. A less well-known narrative change that came about as a result of the political, uh, as a result of political correctness, is changes made to the Pirates of the Caribbean in 2017-2018 in response to the Me Too movement and the call for gender equality. Specifically, the bride auction in the ride, perhaps one of the most infamous scenes in the ride, uh, became an auction led by a female pirate. While these changes seem progressive and positive at first glance, on closer inspection, this is called into question. Uh, in this essay, I will suggest that even though the aesthetics and narrative of, of the scene has changed drastically, the underlying message has pretty much stayed the same. Uh, before discussing the changes to the ride, I must first explain the original narrative of not only the scene, but the entire ride. According to Disney guests, quote, steer a course for the golden age of piracy on a swashbuckling cruise through seas plagued by scoundrels, uh, end quote. Uh, they are transported, quote, to a long forgotten time and place when pirates and privateers ruled the seas, end quote. Uh, after plunging down a waterfall and sailing through Pirate's Grotto or Dead Man's Cove, you uh, navigate cannon fire between a Caribbean fort and a striking 12-gun galleon before, quote, beholding boisterous buccaneers drunk on the spoils of plundering as flames engulf a seaside town, end quote. Uh, and it is in this seaside town that guests come upon the auction. Uh, under a sign advertising the ability to take a wench for a bride, guests are greeted with six women on the auction block, uh, exhibiting various levels of consent. First, guests sees four women with their wrists tied together by a rope held by a male pirate. Uh, their demeanors ranging from sad to resigned, uh, hints that they are not active participants uh, in the auction. Uh, the current wench being auctioned is a woman of larger stature, uh, who appears to be more accepting of the auction, even immediately complying when the auctioneer tells her to, quote, show me your larboard side, uh, end quote. This obvious fat joke is perhaps a statement saying that overweight women should accept any man that wants them, even if he is a disreputable man who is buying her. Uh, of course, that might not be much different than the standard wedding practices of the time. Uh, the final bride for auction, uh, the redhead from the title, of my paper, uh, is an active participant in the auction, wearing her finest red dress and flirting with the pirates. She even goes as far as showing uh, her leg, which results in the auctioneer rebuking her by saying, quote, strike your colors, you brazen wench. No need to expose your superstructure, end quote. Uh, the fact that the redhead is presented as an active participant in her being trafficked, uh, with at least one other woman seemingly okay with it, uh, it is easy to see why this change, or why the scene was changed, especially when we take into consideration the uh, when the changes occurred. From July 2017 to June 2018, uh, during the height of the initial wave of the Me Too movement, Disney made changes to this auction scene at Disneyland in Paris, uh, Disneyland in California, and Walt Disney World in uh, Florida. 
the parks uh, they are the sole owner operator of. Uh, to eliminate these references to human trafficking and the inherent misogyny and replace it with, quote, a colorful auction of villagers' goods. Uh, now, instead of first being greeted with four women on a rope leash, uh, there are a mixture of men and women holding art and home decor objects, a chandelier, a clock, a portrait, and a bust, uh, to be auctioned off. Since Disney just repurposed and in some cases regendered the original animatronics, uh, the lack of complicity in the auction continues for these four. The woman of larger stature is holding some chickens that are currently being auctioned off, uh, much to the anger of the pirate bidders, uh, who, as they are only interested in the rum that is being auctioned off. And while the auctioneer is the same as the original incarnation, he's not in charge of the auction anymore. Instead, this honor now belongs to a, quote, well-armed lass. Uh, as you might uh, have been able to guess, this is the new version of the redhead that was once the prize auction lot. Uh, she has been named Red, uh, R-E-D-D, -D, uh, and has, quote, just pillaged the town's rum supply. Uh, throughout the scene, she tells the auctioneer what to do, which is mostly to hurry up and get to selling the rum. While she is still an active participant in the auction, uh, since she's not selling herself, uh, the misogyny is no longer present, and instead there is an element of female empowerment uh, even if it is perhaps not that historically accurate. Uh, while there were female pirates in the Caribbean during the 17th century, most notably Anne Bonny and Mary Reed, uh, they were typically just crew members and or the wives of pirates. Uh, and sometimes they even had to disguise themselves as men. Uh, this potential anachronism actually somewhat makes sense when it is placed in the, into the context of Disney's engagement with history within their parks. Uh, since the opening of Disneyland in 1955, the Disney parks uh, have had an interesting relationship with history. Well, quote, Disneyland was dedicated to the ideals, the dreams, and the hard facts that have created America, uh, end quote. Uh, that's from Walt Disney's introduction to Disney World, or dedication to Disneyland. They've not always represented this history accurately. Uh, instead, as many, callers, and as many scholars have pointed out, Disney instead presents a utopian vision of history, especially American history, and the possibilities of utopian future. As scholars such as Alan Bryman, Cher Crows Knight, and Jason J. Wallen have suggested, the Disney parks were created as a place to escape the pressures of today and it, instead explore the utopias of the past uh, and even the future. Uh, this idea to escape can be traced back to the opening day of Disneyland in 1955. Uh, as Walt Disney said in his dedication to Disneyland, quote, to all who come to this happy place, welcome. Disneyland is your land. Here, age relives fond memories of the past, and here youth may savor the challenge and promise of the future, end quote. Uh, looking specifically at the mention of the past, uh, this focus on happy and fond uh, could perhaps explain why the scene was changed. Uh, there is no way that a guest would attach these adjectives to the original scene to that original uh, bride auction. By changing the scene to the female-led uh, auction, they are presenting what they wish the world would have been like during the golden age of piracy. Uh, in some ways, this new auction is the embodiment of the plaque that can be found in the entrance to the Magic Kingdom in Walt Disney World, uh, which says, here you leave today and enter the world of yesterday, tomorrow, and fantasy. By infusing the desired gender roles of tomorrow, into the ride they are create uh, into the ride they are creating a fantasy vision of yesterday uh, that being said a closer investigation into the ride reveals that these changes might not be as modern and aware as they seem they might not be as empowering as disney hoped for and advertised the first element of this ride that challenges the power of the change is the theme song for the ride yo ho yo ho a pirate's life for me uh, which is present multiple times throughout the ride, both with and without lyrics. And it is the lyrics uh, that are important for our discussion. The lyrics of the song celebrate and list the things that the pirates like about the lifestyle, uh, which is perhaps not that surprising given the title of the song. They tell us that, quote, they pillage, plunder, they rifle and loot, extort and pilfer, filch and sack, maraud and embezzle, and even hijack. They kindle and char and inflame and ignite, burn up the city, they're really a fright, end quote. They happily extol uh, their acts of piracy while encouraging the listeners to drink up me hearties yo-ho. 
Uh, furthermore, they describe themselves as, quote, rascals and scoundrels, villains and knaves, devils and black sheep, really bad eggs, beggars and blighters, and ne'er-do-well cads. But this is all okay because, quote, they're loved by their mummies and dads, end quote. Uh, they do not care what anyone else thinks of them because their parent still cares for them. And in the ride, we see some of these acts as we travel through the city in which the auction takes place. Uh, they include torturing a man for information by lowering him into a well, uh, and the fact that, as previously mentioned, quote, flames engulf the seaside town. Not only do we hear about their crimes, we actually see some of them enacted. Uh, while these are, of course, villainous acts, there is another line that can be read as a result uh, relating to sexual assault. The second list of crimes sung about is that, quote, they kidnap and ravage and don't give a hoot, uh, end quote. While the, liter or while the dictionary definition of ravage, uh, which according to the Oxford English Dictionary is uh, to devastate, lay waste, to land, a country, et cetera, as by deliberate destruction or plunder, end quote, um, that definition is definitely in line with piracy and the other verbs used in the song. But there is a more colloquial meaning uh, which changes this line. Building off of this original definition, ravage has come to have a sexual connotation uh, when the object ravage is another human. Instead of laying waste to a land, you do so to your partner. While this might not have been Xavier Atencio's uh, The Lyricist and Disney's original intention, we cannot ignore it, especially since it is paired with the word kidnap. Uh, when looking at the other sets of crimes in this song, we see that they build off of each other. The second and or third crime listed off of that uh, listed builds off of the first to paint a clear picture of the actions. With this in mind, this line of the song is basically saying they, they kidnap and rape townspeople and do not care what others would uh, see that, that this is wrong. As they say, they don't give a hoot. If Disney wanted to remove all of the references to sexual assault and human trafficking, it should have changed this line uh, which was still in the ride as of late September, 2021. Uh, while this line in the song could simply be overlooked, could have been overlooked, uh, or left uh, the same based on the dictionary definition of ravage, when we take a closer look at the new auction lots, we see that the change might not be as progressive as we first thought uh, and as Disney intended. While it might seem strange that the auctioning of home decor, art, and animals could continue the narrative of human trafficking, this is surprisingly true. Uh, this is due to the fact that the majority of the new auction lots are still female. Uh, first, unless we want to see it as a large piece of jewelry, the chandelier does not actually uh, retain this narrative. Next, the clock could be a grandmother clock, uh, but since I'm not an expert on clocks and cannot get close enough to actually measure it, I can only say that it appears to be closer to five to six feet in height, uh, the typical height for a grandmother clock. However, since it is rent resting on the back of a townsperson, it's really hard to actually say. Uh, when it comes to the painting and the bust, both of these explicitly represent women. Uh, even though they are not inanimate objects, the pirates are still planning to sell women, just representations of them. However, the auction lot that best retains the idea of trafficking is the chickens that are currently being auctioned when you travel through the ride. This is due to the fact that all the chickens being auctioned off are hens. Furthermore, in the hopes of generating more interest, the auctioneer states that they are, quote, party hens, every one an egg layer, end quote. He specifically highlights their fertility and reproductive capability in the hopes of ensnaring the male pirates. This is not that different than uh, what took place when he was encouraging the men to, quote, take a wench for a bride. Uh, even though he's no longer selling live human women, he's still selling females. By changing the auction lots from women to icons of women, uh, both inanimate and non-human animals, uh, the overt message of human trafficking and sexual exploitation is removed from the ride, but it still remains hidden in the ride. The ride is still trafficking in the selling of women based on their looks and their potential fertility. Uh, even though they are no longer showing the actual selling of women, they're still exploiting them. While Disney has been somewhat celebrated for updating this ride to be more in line with modern sensibilities by those in the media and by some of the fans of the ride, uh, the fact that they have just made the original message implicit might make us wonder if Disney actually wanted to make the changes or if they were just trying to appease their critics and appear to be in line with the Me Too movement. Due to the fact that Disney has been striving to correct 
uh, their presentation of gender and gender roles in much of their media creations, I think they should be given the benefit of the doubt here. Uh, Disney has been embracing modern gender sensibilities in their other works, so why not here? I can only hope that when the changes are completed on the Jungle Cruise and Splash Mountain, that there is not uh, ambiguity like there is in the case of Pirates of the Caribbean. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. That was fascinating and uh, made me rethink the ride that I've been on a couple of times with my kids, but we'll come back to have some opportunity to discuss uh, later. Since uh, Liz is not here, our second presenter that moves us along to uh, Magdalene. Oh. And Magdalene Key is an associate professor of English at Hong Kong Baptist University. She's the author of Jane Austen and Altruism and Jane Austen and the Dialectic of Misrecognition. She's contributed essays to Scandinavian studies, post studies, and philosophy and literature. The title of her talk, Pride and Prejudice and the Rise of a Zombie Nation. Okay, um, thank you, Chair. Uh, let me share my screen. So I hope everybody can see. Yes. Okay, good, lovely. Um, hello, everybody. My talk today is on Prime Prejudice and the Rise of a Zombie Nation, so let's get started. Class struggle is a very real thing in the Regency era. So in terms of demographics, Austin society is, is a highly stratified world. The gentry folks include the second to the fourth class, so you have a, a wide spectrum here. The Austins belong to the fourth class as a lesser clergy. Her father's income was about 600 pounds a year in 1800. In Prime Prejudice, most of the characters belong to the second or third class. Lady Catherine has blue blood. Why people love Mr. Darcy? Because he actually is mega rich. 60% of the population in those days earn less than 30 pounds a year. Mr. Darcy is a landed gentry with an annual income of 10,000 um, pounds. This, this line is repeated in the story multiple times. So according to Didier Lefebvre's calculation in 2002, so there's like a calculation 20 years ago, Darcy's income should be multiplied by 50 times. And that would be roughly 500,000 pounds per year or 681,000 US dollars in today's money. Mr. Bingley has about 5,000 a year and Mr. Bennett has 2,000 only. He, an, he has an estate, but he has no son. So Longbourn is entailed away to be possessed by Mr. Collins. Jing and Lizzie can only inherit 1,000 pounds after the death of both of their parents. So given the huge financial and status gaps between the bandits and others, there are very good reasons why people look down on the bandits. And that's a lot of passive aggressive behaviors depicted in the novels, which include sarcasm, silence, ridicule, etc. When Mr. Collins or Sir William talks to Ms. Darcy, Darcy has no desire to talk to them. And Darcy has no desire to talk to the bandits either. What makes Lizzie special is that her sharp words, angry smiles, her refusal of his proposal prove that she's not a gold digger. As a result, Darcy finds that love is now a matter of frustration attraction. He cannot have her. So he has to prove himself that he's worthy of her regard. And the change is of course, constructive communication. So in the second half of the novel, Darcy talks to everybody. He talks to the Wickhams, he talks to the Phillipses, talks to the gardeners. He provides a bridging function in the novel, crossing all kinds of class, social, geographic boundaries to expedite Lydia's marriage and of course, to get himself a wife. So Lizzie at the end is forced to admit that he's not a cold man, but a cool guy. And Pamberley develops a rather inclusive culture at the end to tolerate the Wickhams, the Phillipses, the Lucases, the Gardeners and the Bennets. So this is a lovely story, it's like a fairy tale. So um, Prime Prejudice has been adapted over 10 times. And obviously there are also spin-offs and mashups. And increasingly, Austin is being repurposed to highlight the differences between the upstairs and the downstairs people. And Austin's, you know, class harmony, the notion of rep, the politics of recognition is, you know, is being underemphasized. So in 2009, Seth, Graham Smith revised the novel and turned into a zombie story to single out interclass and intra-class struggles. And this greatly upset a lot of conservative Jane Knights 
Macy Harford of the New Yorker describes the book as 85% Austin, 15% a television writer named Seth Graham Smith, and 100% terrible. But in an interview, the author justifies himself in this way. We live in an age where it is very easy to be afraid of everything that's going on in the world. There are these large groups of faceless people who mean to do us harm and cannot be reasoned with. Zombies are sort of familiar territory. So he's basically referring to American xenophobia here. Um, this is also very much in line with Hollywood's vision because Hollywood loves to dramatize the idea that someone is going to invade us, aliens, mummies, zombies, vampires, etc. And Camilla Nelson argues that the zombie stories should not be read only as a representation of 19th century British culture, but as a product of 21st century American literature. But what is so alarming in the new version is that it highlights the rise of a zombie nation. In terms of demographics, the country is full of what we call low-end population. Vampires are aristocratic and whiter and white creatures, but zombies represent the undead, the wounded, the injured, the brain dead, the anti-intellectual, the impoverished class that are poor, ugly, inarticulate. They are dangerous, unemployable. They are not willing to work. Their primary purpose is to cure their own kind for a sake of survival. A zombie nation exists at the level of survival, but it is doomed because it is anti-productive and it is a man-eat-man -man society. All are cannibals, but once all humans are consumed, the food will run out. So this is a vicious cycle of low production, high consumption, and it leads to a bad end. In zombie economics, John Quicken attacks the American faith in the self-regulating market, the belief in the invisible hand, or what he calls the efficient market hypothesis. And Hong Kongers really believe in that, okay? Um, the laissez-faire, you know, policy, the competition, et cetera, et cetera. So John Quicken attacks all these things and said that these are zombie ideas, okay? So uh, he does not believe in the idea of efficient market. And he also attacks the trickle-down hypothesis, arguing that money usually trickles up rather than trickles down. Some people become a lot wealthier, but the average people with an average education, uh, average education just have average wages. He also attacked privatization and the equilibrium model. He argues that these are all zombie ideas that should be buried in order to secure better government policies that generate a more equitable distribution of resources. In zombies and in prime prejudice and zombies, there is definitely no equitable redistribution of resources. Zombies represent the unland, the untitled underclass. They live in absolute poverty and they are excluded from political participation. In that regard, the new version can be quite realistic because it shows the dark side of Austin society at the time. Due to the outbreak of the Napoleonic Wars, Anglo-American War, National debt rose to around 900 million pounds in 1816. Many people also lost their homes due to the enclosure movement. Um, they were hungry and there were food riots every five years or so, and bread riots. And the government, because of all the war debts, the, um, the government imposed the first income tax in English history. It was so unpopular that they had to scrap it 18 years later. And uh, due to all the riots, um, eventually at some point, King George III, his coach was being attacked. So the government decided to introduce this thing called Treasonable Practices and Seditious Meetings Act, which definitely aim at curtailing political freedom and curtailing all radical societies and all the activities. So you have uh, control when it comes to um, a limit of freedom regarding the press, freedom of speech, and also a freedom of assembly, very much like the Hong Kong society these days. So um, industrialization, of course, emphasized productivity. As owners wanted to have machines rather than workers, well, these days people like to have robots rather than workers, right? These led in the 19th century, this led to looters riots between 1811 to 1818, and eventually 17 looters uh, were executed in 1813. There was also bank panic in 1815 to 1816, and this is actually the image of Henry Austin, Jane Austen's favorite brother. Um, he was a London banker, but his bank folded as a result of the bank panic. He later on became a clergyman. And of course, the zombie metaphor is relevant because the origin of zombies is linked to heightened slavery. 
and also was concerned with the slave trade and the slave riots in the West Indies and Mansfield Park. And the film is further mentioned that from the colonies came not only silks and spices, but also an abominable plague, of course, that's zombieism. And some also blamed the French for the zombies' revolutionary spirit. What zombies spread so quickly? Because Terry Eagleton rightly points out that in Austin society, it is a society that is already shaken to its roots by riots, agrarian discontent, economic depression, working class militancy, the threat of revolution abroad, and invasion at home. In Grant Smith's story, the trigger is, of course, a highly polarized society. The ruling class are trained to be good fighters so they can resist zombification, they know how to fight back. The working class are untrained. Their working conditions further expose them to professional horses. They are ambushed because they have to work and go to places. So coach drivers and bodyguards are often killed and zombified. A blacksmith also becomes a zombie. The household staff at Neverville are consumed by two zombies. So eventually a dozen servants, four maids, two cooks and a steward all perished. The McGregors are doomed because they deliver lamb oil. Mr. Beachman's orphans are likewise zombified. But once the underclass are zombified, they spread like virus to turn the upper class to become zombies as well, and all become problematic creatures. And their flesh can be in varying degrees of putrefaction. A zombie nation stands for a society with true equality, true equal outcome, but zero growth potential. The government's plan is, of course, to eliminate the zombies. Zombies are simply killed and they're to be burned on the top of Oakham Mount, which becomes a touristic site to entertain the ruling class. To defend humanity, the gentry class is biased to be uh, fighters. So they want to have an oriental education that emphasizes martial arts so they can be more Bruce Lee than Bruce Lee. It shouldn't degenerate into a cult of sadomasochistic training. The Bennett sisters are trained to pledge allegiance to the warrior code. They can work and become bodyguards, assassins, if they need to be. In the book, Lizzie once kills a ninja, and she herself is not unlike a zombie when she eats the heart. And she says, curious, I have tasted many a heart, but I dare say, I found the Japanese ones a bit tender. As such, the book and the film characterize women warriors as feminist icons. In the name of the honor culture and the warrior code, Elizabeth justifies, Elizabeth finds it justifiable to kill her enemy, even though it's just a minor offense committed by others. Darcy upsets her, and she wants to follow this proud Mr. Darcy outside and open his throat. In that regard, the defenders of civilization can change from using instrumental violence to welcoming orgasmatic violence, and this can effectively bankrupt Western humanism. The film is different. Due to the threat of zombies, the ruling class not only turns militant, but also becomes increasingly authoritarian. Catherine, Lady Catherine is like the Queen of England, an angelic bricked warrior who can kill Lucifer. Darcy's role is also changed. He is a social leader in the book. He is in town for a meeting of the League of Gentlemen, blah, blah, but in the film, he has a military title. Colonel Darcy is responsible for national security. The medical authority also has great biopower to examine and eliminate a person or quarantine a alleged victim, such as Jane Bennett. The army also limits people's freedom of movement due to stoning restrictions. The ruling class also has a no mercy, no negotiation outlook, and this is very much reinforced by Lady Catherine's policy of you know, refusing any dialogue or communication with the zombies. So zombies and humans belong to two worlds. And at some point, Wickham appears as a middleman to persuade the ruling class to share power and resources. The congregation at St. Lazarus, according to him, demonstrates the advanced state of zombie ethics. Zombies can live on pig springs and religion gives them power to resist their aggressive instincts and become pacifists. Um, they have a different political outlook that does not welcome monarchy, so they're very progressive in that regard. And Richard Leahy notes that the mass underclass can speak and coordinate, and this indicates a kind of unionism. And these zombies can rouse our sympathy because of their articulateness and their noble vision. 
In Austen's version, Darcy's love for Lizzie acts as a catalyst to heal the society, leading to class harmony. People are reconnected. In the new versions, Darcy's love for Lizzie destroys everything because Wickham has Lydia to save Lydia, Darcy steals the corpse. And Darcy used dead soldier springs to feed and seduce the good zombies to buy him time in order to save Lydia. Once good zombies consume human brains, they turn evil. Now all zombies are evil. So the end of the story delivers a very troubled message. Love cannot change the world. In the book, Charlotte is beheaded by Collins and Collins later on commits suicide. So this part is not mentioned in the film at all. And the film Communication with the Other also comes to an end. It is true that Lizzie can become Mrs. Darcy and the Bennets are accepted by the rather snobbish Lady Catherine. However, the two world phenomenon can still cancel everybody's happiness. The ruling class is not winning. The kith and kin are zombified. Zombies, once attacked, never fail. London has fallen. Rosings is also under attack and they will one day probably conquer Pemberley. So this is very consistent with Hollywood's vision. The film implies that the Antichrist has come and there is no happy ending. Aristocracy, or the modern way, okay, operates in a hierarchical and authoritarian manner. The rich may try to reform and become a little bit more accepting, but the story implies that the, the system will fall. A small group of good zombies, you know, they can be virtuous, religious, um, they also hope to run for the parliament, but unfortunately, because of Mr. Darcy, they are corrupted and they are no more. Zombies are anarchists. They are anti-establishment, violent. Whatever they have, they will destroy. As such, they don't produce and they're always hungry. And they are disorganized with no structure or power center. However, at the end of the story, they are willing to be led by an antichrist figure. And so this begins the zombie apocalypse and the era of the four horsemen. In the book of Revelations in the Bible, the four horsemen refer to the wild beast, war, famine, plague, or death. If Wickham is indeed the wild beast, once he's, he replaces Lady Catherine, he'll bring war, famine, and death. So a zombie nation highlights true equality, but it is a country in which all are poor, stupid, or all are dead, or undead. So um, this, uh, this is film and, and novels basically um, fits the theme of the conference very well, a city of death and city of destruction. It's a rather sad message. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Nadi. I think that's some, you raised some fascinating issues that I think do tie well, as you said, to the broader topic that we have for this conference. So uh, we'll come back to some of that as we get into our question and answer session at the end. Um, our next panelist is Sudibi Giddy, is a graduate student in the Department of English Literature at the English Foreign Languages University in Hyderabad, India. Her current research focuses on the remediation of graffiti in 19th and 20th century American literary texts the title of her talk is Cultural History of Graffiti in America from the 1800s through the 1960s. So the floor is yours. Give me a second. Yeah, go right ahead, take your time. With one panelist out, our timeline is less tight than it was initially, so. Okay, okay. We don't need to rush. Okay. So I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. It's just the title slide. So the uh, title of my paper is The Cultural uh, History of Graffiti in America from the 1800s to 1960s. So much of current discourse and handbooks of American popular culture have centered research on the cultural history of graffiti from 1970s onwards, leaving out a greater chunk of the preceding century that uh, stores a radically different picture. Even when there have been attempts, uh, uh, they have touched on it cursorily. This paper seeks to wedge this gap and focuses on the cultural history of graffiti from the 1800s to 1960s 
and adopts gra graffiti as a frame of cultural historical analysis to understand how time, ideology, and cultural industry systems confer st uh, status to an expressive form, and how an expressive form in turn shapes the cultural, uh, ideological, and historical stratification of a nation and its peoples. It presupposes two principles of inquiry. One is to consider the amic and atic responses of uh, uh, graffiti, along with its evaluation of different typologies and uh, 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 different typologies so that uh, uh, one can assess its historical heterologies of reception, consumption, and production. By amic responses, I mean responses that are generated from the practice of graffiti and the socio-symbolic and aesthetic belief systems of its, of its practitioners who are from diverse groups and attest different functions to their graffiti practice. Whereas atic responses are inputs of observers of graffiti who more than often are already in the position of power to steer the larger engine of culture, art, behavior, and codes of the nation. Like the diversity of graffiti practitioners, atic respondents too are constituted from a heterogeneous group and their engagement with graffiti differs with particular types, contexts, and purposes. The second method of inquiry, I argue, is to move away from uh, art non-art paradigm uh, to assess graffiti, since it restricts a multi-perspectival uh, approach that can very well offer a window to show broader and specific stages of social, economic, and political interactions. So in this paper, I trace historically neat distinctions and messy overlappings in graffiti response, uh, sorry, in graffiti's reception to propose that by attending to graffiti's highly contingent subjection to evaluated to evaluative and shifting categories, one can infer the already existing blurring in the boundaries uh, uh, of, uh, of the expressive form as it uh, moves across the context zone of national culture, high culture, popular culture, and subculture. I'll expand this point by focusing on lesser discussed example of graffiti reception and typologies and reassess the subjective viewpoints of the producers and consumers of graffiti across a wider national and historical spectrum. So in the early 19th century, reception of graffiti was largely based on atic responses. These responses stemmed from a prescriptive consensus made articulate for a national collective and the graffiti responded were elements of residual culture uh, in, uh, in the American frontier. Statements around graffiti uh, were invested in the saga of Western expansion and the manufacturing of nationalism, whereby reviving historical memory and contributions of pioneer uh, explorers such as Daniel Boone and the surveyors of the Lewis and Clark expedition who had left in their graffiti the records of national territory and ownership was thought essential. Boone's graffiti was particularly remembered for reverting the marks left by uh, Native Indians in the wilderness of Kentucky and was uh, seen as a strategic announcement for annex annexing more space for a new United States. The future president to be Theodore Roosevelt in his well-received work, The Winning of the West, eulogized Daniel Boone as a daring Blackwoodsman hero and produced in grapho verbatim in his book, Boone's Graffiti that he had carved in 1970 onto a birch tree um, of Watagua, now named as Boone Creek. On the other hand, the graffiti of Lewis and Clark expedition across the route of Louisiana territory were stipulated by the rules of the Jefferson, sorry, Jefferson government to build a supplementary national archive and to temporarily take control of the native Indian lands. Private Joseph Whitehouse and Sergeant John Ordway, the two members of this expedition, recalled that the branding of the US mark was done to prevent the savages from disturbing and thereby evincing through the group members own individual mark, the official reordering of the nation. Reports of the Pathfinder exhibition by Colonel John Charles Fremont also acquainted the American readers about the graffiti of rock independence in Wyoming, where was inscribed, and I quote, many a name famous in the history of this country and some well-known to science are to be mixed among traders, travelers, and missionaries. These graffiti, unquote, these graffiti con contributions to national history fulfill the ideological uh, uh, position of their producers. 
As a collective, they represented the influential bourgeois mercantilist network who were bidding the political econ economy of the nation. And therefore, any riffraff produced by them entered into the narrative of national veneration. They were received as historical artifacts and their extra aesthetic quality found potency in the rhetoric set by ethnocentric and nationalist ideology. Reception of Pompeian graffiti exhilarated the proliferation of American tourist graffiti, and it became a form of popular practice among transatlantic tra uh, American travelers. A change in perspective sets in when debates surrounding graffiti were paired with American tra travelers' overseas civility and abjur abjuration of hospitality ethics. And as an example to reflect on the encouraging and deplorable shades of national culture, Mark Twain in his lectures and his uh, uh, travel book, All the Innocents Abroad, uh, while being appreciative of the ancient graffiti at Pompeii, is also disturbed by his fellow travelers about whom he concluded, and I quote, travel broadened some of these American vandals only in the sense that they now scribble their names on foreign lands instead of a privy wall back home, unquote. Twain narrates another incident in the book, and this takes place at Nazareth, where pilgrims, if not, he says, reprimanded by the guiding priests, would have, quote, very well uh, got out their lamp black and stencil plates and paint their names on the rock, together with the names of the villages they hailed from America, unquote. Twain alludes to an important church prescription that is conveyed by the priest to the, uh, to the touring pilgrim, some, something that goes back to the rules set by Felix Fevry in the 15th century. That is, the pilgrims going to the Holy Land must not deface any wall or column or, uh, or statue by scribbling their names since, quote, such a conduct gives great offense to the Saracen rulers, unquote. Scriptural delinquency as these examples show, was regarded not only degenerative and poorly of the pilgrims' national culture, but also violated hospitality of the host country. But the, this belief was not accepted by other, tra other American travelers like John Leol Stephens and Carter Henry Harrison, who wrote in their traveler accounts how their graffiti was a sense of homage making and reconnection with their own countrymen and friends who had traveled to the same uh, places abroad and left their marks on historical sites. Stephens and Harrison really in their amic responses evoke a kind of scripture, uh, scriptural community that, pa that pairs two countrymen in their graphic uh, commemoration. Late 1870s and early 20th century America had its own vibrant graffiti culture, but it was closely guarded among the wanderlust migratory culture of the tramps and hobos. The ethic responses on tramp graffiti saw it as a tool of, uh, uh, lawless under, of the lawless underground and vigilant print media of the times donned the hat of cultural appraiser, declaring that the tramp graffiti have no poetry, none of the grace notes of literature, uh, and their uh, cabalistic uh, language is only confined to their uh, uh, fellow traveling brothers. Such a response is perhaps not unsettling at a time when the rapid persecution of the Jews, the Romes, and the tramps who resorted to uh, this language as communication and movement were seen as nuisance in a rapidly industrialized uh, city space of the Western world. However, if one looks at the amic responses, the hobo and tramp graffiti practitioners, such as Jack London, Jim, Jim Tewley, and Leon Ray Livingston, um, graffiti becomes an instrumental, met instru instrumental method of ensuring survival to seek security of food and work. Besides this utilitarian gains, it was also seen as an art of self-presentation as Monica writing became a form of personal art for them, which required skill, innovation, and high taste, even when it was not recognized by outsiders as an art form for a long time. And when anthropolo anthropologists were beginning to categorize decor decorative wooden and metal objects made by tramps under the term tramp art. So uh, in the first two decades of the 20th century, the combined knowledge of tramp, hobo, backwoodsman, graffiti of the frontier 
became a pedagogical asset for nurturing the skills of outdoormanship among young white boys and new generation war facing American men. Eminent scouting trainer Daniel Carter Beard insisted to recuperate some of the graffiti symbols of tramps, pioneers, and gypsies in scout pedagogy and hoped that the graffiti symbols may help, may be of great uh, service to the scout boys who will be the future fighting uh, men of the country. So the case of tramp and hobo graffiti offers an interesting account in the way amic and atic responses blur out differences in, the significant, in its significance and practice. In the 30s America, atic responses to graffiti with regards to the domestic landscape prompted competitive imageries that had direct bearing on the notion of urban purity discourses and carnivalist disordering of order in national parks that transformed into heterotropic spaces. As commerce and crowding in American urban centers grew exponentially, cities which were earlier modeled on Republican architectural style had to adopt a utilitarian model of living and public space. Adolf Luf, the Austrian, Austrian architect, in this context of puristic utility that American lifestyle and living spaces exemplified, brought in the analogy of graffiti to plea against ornamentation uh, or extravagant expressivity onto urban space. He uh, denounced this form as a, um, this practice as a form of primitivism, pure, uh, puerility, and degeneracy. And he uses the visual trope of graffiti to advance an urban purity, purity discourse, wherein the American uh, aristocrats must ensure that there be no such crashness, that their, their cities should glisten like white walls, and the aristocrat is to be the upholder of his class and superior culture in his resident city. Quite contrary to this, Alan Walker reads book on graffiti that uh, um, uh, takes the graffiti uh, uh, of the uh, national parks of the North American West. He says that uh, he downright dis uh, he does not downright discards it, but he treats it as a minority cultural practice that could be very well see seen as part of national custom. Unbothered to rules of the park authorities, the graffiti of the national park, by the sheer number of its overpresence, where carnivalists, its practitioners flouted normative social order, and this was a serious blow to puristic urbanity. The graffiti acts turned the space into heterotopic space, a space unhindered by class expectations of conduct. The interim between Second World War and Korean War demonstrates a revised perspective on graffiti with America's circulation of soft wartime propaganda. And the graffiti Kilroy was, was here enters into formal and popular culture by blurring the differences between the elite and the common citizenry and between atic and amic responses. Appearing at the start of the war in 1939, Kilroy graffiti enjoyed the status of national insignia and a means of national mobilization, as had been the case with the Uncle Sam and Donald Getz drafted posters. As a war semiology, it fused into the military industrial entertainment network, moving from shipping industry to its leisurely strategic use in war front. Uh, cultural replication of Kilroy graffiti permeated the vocabulary of entertainment and art, arts industry. And we see that in the 1947 film by Phil Carlson and mass produced statue memorial, memorabilia by the Steinberg Willis Company, manufacture, uh, which manufactured pro war sentiments by incorporating Kilroy graffiti in their work. We see in poetry as well, and in the poem of Peter Warrick, uh, Kilroy was here. Uh, uh, where it uh, dispensed a wanting national myth for uh, his fellow citizens and addressed all American soldiers as Kilroy, who were uh, allegorized versions of Ulysses, Marco Polo, and even God. Kilroy's resonance in American popular mind could not be overlooked in the state military diplomacy and in consolidating war troops. During the eve of the Korean War, Sergeant Bernard De Delay commissioned uh, a, a German artist to prepare a brochure mes message for soldiers with a welcoming signboard at, uh, advertisement in the recruiting journal, which read, quote, Kilroy was here, liked it too. He re-enlisted, re why don't you, unquote. But with, with time, America's mil military high-handedness in international affairs gradually generated a dysphoria of sorts among the public at home. And this is articulated well in 
uh, Tennessee Williams' uh, uh, surreal symbolism of Camino Real, a play with abstract version of confusion and dread by the cold that has been created by the Cold War. Here, Kilroy is not the confident soldier of the Second World War, but an everyman American in an unknown land who is confounded by an inscription that said, Kilroy is coming. This partly shows the lost enthusiasm of the American soldier in an alien territory and his constant tumbling down into a forced trap where his own, uh, uh, where his own freedom is put at stake for maintaining the powerful and liberated image of America. The 1956 avant-garde modernism had its fair share in importing a genre of graffiti from Europe into the presence of the American art world. And with it, the art speaks of American cultural magazines ushered in the intellectualization of American graffiti. These again centered on ethic responses where the producers of graffiti had no role to influence the uh, interpretation of graffiti. In a classic modernist uh, reading of graffiti as an autonomous text and as a found object, uh, established artists, critics, and writers gave free reign to their academic faculty. It started with Brassai's photographic uh, graffiti collection from Parisian streets, which were exhibited in America for the first time in the Museum of uh, Modern Art. Brassai followed a similar anthropological lens to appreciate graffiti as had been uh, with the supporters of Art Nouveau, primitive art and outsider's art. In his catalog, he uh, attached a prose poem in which he declared graffiti as the most authentic art. Now Brassai's exhibition prompted American intellectuals like John Updike to look at their own city's graffiti and assess their skill. So writing for the New Yorker, Abdai's essay, Local Graffiti, praised the graffiti novice of Mulberry Street, who could with equal skill replicate the lines of Jackson's canvas or chalk a vorticist woman. Abdai's associative imageries of high art were not promotional embellishment to put graffiti uh, 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 into gallery context, but it signified a period when the gallery and avant-garde artists such as Robert Rauschenberg and Sai Tombley had started incorporating graffiti as part of their visual language. With the insurgence of the 60s counterculture that rejected the conservative fabric of older generation, the amic and atic responses of graffiti again merged in the swelling expository discourse of the public space, wherein graffiti took the form of an aged prop. American students and hippies have had their own model of culture jamming graffiti, that dealt with anti-war sentiments, sexual uh, revolution, commune living, and LSD voyaging. Cushioned spaces of campuses and venues of street demonstration adopted graffiti's visual power to stage freedom of speech and campaigns of civil rights movement. These further developed a strange mix of reasoning that vouched pro-graffiti tendencies when mainstream and culture industries started responding to alternative cultural experiments. And the result was this. Occasional uh, opets in magazines advised helicopter parents uh, not to see their uh, children's wall writing as taboo, while graffiti books began, uh, became popular as Christmas gift for schoolgoers. The publication of books on graffiti by Robert Reznor presented debates on whether teaching gra graffiti in college is any good, while college youths demanded university administrations for the writerly freedom of re restroom graffitis on campuses. Magazine readers could send their favorite found graffiti quotes to Norton Mockridge of La Habra Star, and which in turn could be com uh, compiled into a book form and sold to the same contributors as prized collectibles. All these examples show that graffiti was tolerated and utilized for its formal and contextual flexibility. And we also see popular cultural texts record graffiti's resistant and iconoclastic energy. In the beat canon, we can uh, come across Allen Ginsberg's autobiographical graffiti related debating, entering into the lines of Owl and his experience of pol political graffiti at the Syracuse airport in 1968, which later becomes the content of one uh, singular poem, which he wrote in 1972. Music also was not behind in using graffiti's uh, graffiti in using graffiti's um, uh, evading figures as uh, graffiti graffiti's evading uh, figures who come to uh, who, who whom we see uh, uh, represented in Simon and Garfunkel's uh, 
the sound of silence and a poet on underground wall, uh, wall sorry to conclude from being a national artifact to being a product of avant-garde and mass cultural art graffiti's cultural destiny in america between the 1800s and 16 1960s shares a similar fate as any dependent genre heavily drawing its contents and, and significance from the actorial forces of history and cultural markers on the one hand and on the other hand the immediate participants who dispose in different cultural political realms within the nation connect and shape its teleological aims to engage with the questions of graffiti status in cultural history and to uh, uh, think about uh, ways of approaching it is to make steady room for flexibility and acknowledge the differences in the outcome uh, it bears when one embarks to study graffiti's journey, journey either from the perspectives afforded from long dure analysis or from the givens of immediate particulars thank you thank you very much certainly some interesting ideas there that will i am certain come back in our question and answer session so let's move to our last panelist tonight who is alan parks He's a PhD student in US history at the University of Delaware. He studies the impact of neoliberalization, youth subcultures, and anti-drug campaigns from the 1970s and 80s. The title of his talk is Get Up and Go, DC Music, Youth Culture, and Community Formation from 1980 to 1983. And it's all yours, Alan. Thank you. Uh, and, and thanks for uh, letting me join the, the panel tonight. Okay. In the early 1980s, Henry Rollins and Ian McKay, two young Washington, D.C. punks, heard a song on the radio while driving. And as Rollins recalls, quote, the song was so good that we pulled over just so we could listen to it without having to deal with traffic. They waited to hear the radio DJ announce the song title after the song ended. And as Rollins remembers, quote, the lady said, that was Pump Me Up by Trouble Funk. And Ian and I looked at each other and instantly sang, came to the same conclusion. That is the beat we've been waiting to hear our entire lives. The go-go sounds of Trouble Funk and the hardcore punk created by Rollins as a member of Washington, D.C.'s State of Alert and McKay as a singer of Minor Threat, while at seemingly opposite ends of the musical spectrum, exposed a distinctiveness in D.C. music making that marked the 1980s. The political and social realms with which go-go and hardcore punk engaged extended far beyond the walls of subcultural hangouts and venues and provide a basis for understanding power relations more broadly within a historical moment defined by a turn toward post-Keynesian economic ideologies. And in this paper, I contend that contextualizing music-making subcultures locally and alongside each other rather than as distinct subcultures best exposes ways that they at times achieve and at other times fell short of creating alternatives to popular music production and opposition to social and political norms of the 1980s. Go-Go and Hardcore Punk in Washington, D.C. unveiled community formation that depended on a localized do-it-yourself ethos. While Go-Go scene members constructed a community in response to DC's post-industrial and political climate, as well as a history of black suppression in the US, Washington hardcore punk created a community informed largely by its counterparts in cities across the US, but that nonetheless became a markedly identified DC sound. The beat that Rollins and McKay had waited to hear and the subculture they helped form themselves exposed both the weaknesses and entrenched influence the prevailing cultural, social, and political ideologies that define the 1980s. So in GoGo, -Go, by diminishing the bounds between bands and the audiences, crowds became a part of the GoGo of the Go -Go performance and thus reinforced community. For example, go, go bands often engaged in roll calls in which singers declared the names of fans over the band's music. They also encouraged the audience to join in with them through call and response. 
It will go further inspire its own styles of dance, including Happy Feet and the Wop. While audience participation is central to Gogo performances, Black audiences upheld the, their role, quote, in keeping musicians accountable to the vernacular traditions and communal desires of the Black community, as Mark Anthony Neal notes. By the mid-decade, major labels began looking toward DC's go-go scene as potentially marketable to a broader audience. New York City's Black newspaper, Amsterdam News, reported that the growing influence of go-go was, quote, like a rising, like a funkified phoenix from Washington, D.C.'s inner city. Go-go music is threatening to become the nation's next craze. While the music caught the interest of labels outside of Washington, its reliance on audience interaction and the community it fostered in D.C. as the chocolate city or the chocolate capital reinforced its distinction as a Black D.C. sound. Although trouble funk and bands like Experience Unlimited signed with Island Records, they achieved limited success as major label acts. Trouble Funk expressed some discontent with the influence the major label attempted to wield over them. As bassist Big Tony put it, quote, the record company wanted to try something new with the group that I didn't quite feel comfortable with or good about. I wanted to continue that original traditional Trouble Funk go-go sound. I wouldn't care if the record went platinum, I would still feel that way. Isla's efforts to alter Trouble Funk's music likely stemmed from the challenge of marketing and music so closely associated with live performances. Prior to Trouble Funk and Experience Unlimited signing, Jeff Zeldman of uh, Washington Weekly noted, quote, Gogo is a great live sound, but few bands have produced a sophisticated enough sound for major companies. So they remain pretty skeptical if they've even heard of it. The energy of live performances failed to always translate well into recorded albums. And listeners unfamiliar with Gogo were left unable to appreciate the music without associating it with the experience of a Gogo performance and community. Accordingly, Gogo fans gathered at Gogo venues and solidified a community centered on Black music making and culture that central, centralized occupying physical space and communal response to music disarming major label influence and amplifying black agency and taste making, at least within the bounds of the chocolate city. And at the same time, hardcore punk offered a largely white alternative to community formation in the district. Like in Go-Go, hardcore punk bands sought control of the recording and distribution of their music. Hardcore's do-it-yourself ethic upended music industry norms by placing roles attributed to record labels in the hands of musicians who created and performed the music. Hardcore's DIY ethos, however, meant more than musicians creating independent labels. Ryan Moore argues that hardcore's emphasis on, uh, on members doing it themselves, quote, involved a quest for authenticity and independence from the culture industry, thus altogether renouncing the prevailing culture of media, image, and hyper, and hyper -com commercialism. Similarly, Timothy Cuffman writes that Hardcore's emphasis on DIY offered, quote, the radical possibility of reconfiguring a space outside of commercial exchange. An ideal of purity unspoiled by market ability marked Hardcore Punk, represented by artistic control and freedom, untainted by music industry norms, and embedded in the subculture's DIY ethos. Some members of DC's hardcore scene took efforts to maintain purity even further. McKay and fellow minor threat bandmate Jeff Nelson recognized the significance of documenting the hardcore scene through recording and releasing the music of local bands, local bands only, on their Discord record label. Discord was, quote, more interested in documenting the local scene than promoting it. Mark Jenkins uh, wrote that of McKay and Nelson, highlighting the fact that both of them refused to put out bands who saw um, releasing music on the increasingly influential Discord records. Moreover, purity characterized straight edge. Straight edge signaled a relationship between subcultural purity and members' bodies that drew parallels to the Reagan era. 
The straight users often associate their interest in abstaining from drugs and alcohol with both mental and physical fitness, just as the 1980s ushered in an increasingly popular interest in attaining and maintaining specific body types. As Susan Jeffery asserts, the 1980s fostered, quote, what many have come to recognize as a revolution in the US social organization that pivoted on the ability of Ronald Reagan and his administration to portray themselves successfully and distinctively as masculine, decisive, tough, aggressive, strong, and domineering men. Shelley McKenzie writes that fitness in the 1980s became, quote, a statement of personal and professional confidence written on the body. The personal played a key role in conservative idealism, represented by tough, rugged individualism that Reagan displayed in movies, if not in actual real life. Straight edge furthered the credence of individualism. As McKay put it, quote, I see people as people. Straight edge was always in my mind the celebration of an individual's right to choose his or her life. McKay failed to foresee the influence of straight edge, which by 1983 became its own movement within hardcore when he had written a song of the same name. Straight edge quickly became associated with, it, with Washington DC hardcore and aligned it with an air of puritanism that outsiders attributed to the capital's hardcore scene. Minor threat lyrics express similar sentiment. And out of step, McKay shouts, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't fuck. At least I can fucking think. Similarly, in straight edge, she declares, I'm a person just like you, but I've got better things to do than sit around and smoke dope because I know that I can cope. McKay frames a distinction between himself and what he thought of as outsiders as a way to solidify both community, but also to promote his own individualism. In doing so, he was unwittingly creating something of a movement within hardcore that became defined by abstinence as a form of purity from outsiders, moreover insulating white music making. Still, while its community formation stands problematized by its white masculine bounds, hardcore in Washington, DC depended largely on DIY principles and a local emphasis that it shared with GoGo. Moving beyond cultural borders places hardcore punk and go go beside each other and exposes the significance of independence and local cultural formation as a basis for subverting dominant cultural norms. In September of 1983, at the Landberg Cultural Center in downtown Washington, DC, the first ever funk punk spectacular was hosted and featured two of the district's most influential uh, music, musical acts. Uh, of course, was Minor Threat and Trouble Funk. Minor Threat is DC's most well recognized hardcore outfit, offered a high energy performance complemented by the self driving expressionism of Ian McKay for the last time. The band's last song, their last show, offered a reminiscent tone, declaring that, quote, the hardcore has gone soft. Such a declaration seems signified by the band's decision to cross hardcore punk bounds by opening for Trouble Funk. By which, by that point, had attained somewhat a national acclaim through the release of their song Pump Me Up and Drop the Bomb, which asked, quote, Can we drop the bomb on the white boy crew? Despite the differences between the bands and the scenes that they represented, McKay described them as both indigenous music scenes that were really of and about Washington, D.C., despite being unaware of the of the event that would serve as Martha's last performance, McKay saw it as, quote, the perfect last gig. I felt like it was a connection with Washington that I actually had a really deep affinity for. The event blended two subcultural sound and styles. Most powerfully, however, the funk punk spectacular diminished racialized boundaries between go go and hardcore punk and brought together independent DC subcultures, inspiring an almost annual funk punk spectacular sense. Now in some, the subcultural intersections uh, between hardcore punk and go-go as well as other subcultures can expose ways that at times achieve and sometimes fall short of their aims in creating alternatives to popular music production and opposition to social and political norms. 
but they also help to offer both a more holistic understanding of subcultures as well as a broader, a broader historical context. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. So we have a few minutes here for some questions and I certainly will open this up to anyone who would like to uh, unmute and ask a question here of any of the panelists. Um, you're also welcome to type a question into the chat and I will relay those as well to the group. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, Mitchell, go ahead. Great. Um, first off, uh, all your guys' presentations are great and really illuminating on certain areas of culture and subculture and different kind of uh, popular media that I hadn't dwelled on in that type of way in some time. But my um, question in particular is for Alan, um, particularly in uh, delving into and presenting something on minor threat, which is something I haven't really listened to in, in, in a while, but um, your presentation kind of delved into hardcore punk and go-go and uh, minor threat and how this kind of is politically and racially charged. And I was wondering, and you might remember more than I do, um, I believe minor threat has a song in particular called Guilty of Being White. And I was wondering if you could just kind of elaborate on how this might um, have impacted the, the the music scene and their music in particular, or if uh, this song um, in itself kind of is a framework in which to view some of the things you were talking about. Yeah, uh, thanks, Mitchell. Um, absolutely. So so in this longer paper, I mean, you know, I I, I left that out uh, in the interest of time, but. I mean, that's you know, a critical component. So there's a couple of things to say about that. It's, um, after they had written that song, there were people within the hardcore scene, especially people on the West Coast, who you know, were, were critical of the fact that they, they'd written a song called Guilty of Being White, which sort of seemed to undermine any inclusive aims of a hardcore punk scene that, um, that people, especially writers and maximum rock and roll hope to identify hardcore punk with. And, and Ian McKay responded with a, with a not, I mean, not very uh, thoughtful response. And she was, so I went to Wilson High School, Washington DC, which was at the time uh, about 80% uh, black. And he said, so I, you know, I was in the minority and, um, and that was, that seemed to, to, to him to explain, uh, to offer a reasoning for, for, for writing that song. And ultimately, um, I think that, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't give us much nuance, um, but what it does is it shows how he's helping to formulate this community. And since I'm, I'm arguing that community is central to to the formation of these subcultures, but I'm, but I'm not at the same time arguing that that is necessarily good, uh, for lack of a better word. But um, so so I am saying that yes, th that helps define this community. That in this community, in some ways, escaped some of, although maybe not all of, um, uh, broader cultural norms of the era. But in doing so, it allowed it to escape the, the uh, uh, um, musical norms of the year that, that extended beyond DC and it made it distinctly D DC uh, sort of music. Uh, so, so it's, yeah, it, it's tough, but um, I'm trying to balance something where I'm recognizing the fact that I'm trying to find a way that there, there are intersections, but that's a clear area in which, you know, there, there's not, I mean, there, there's, there's clear, there's, there are clear racial distinctions here. Uh, so, yeah, that's a great question. Awesome, yeah, thank you for the response. Yeah, good question, thanks. Anyone else? Uh, just a uh, comment for uh, Sudebi. Um, 
Uh, I th it's in the new anthology of American poetry, which came out, I don't know, 15 years ago or something, uh, edited by Stephen Gould Axelrod uh, with some co-editors. Uh, they included, and I thought this was really interesting, uh, they, they included um, graffiti from the, from the, um, uh, the walls of Angel Island. Uh, you know, for particularly Chinese, uh, but also Korean and Japanese immigrants, uh, um, you know, and, and, you know, kind of establishing that it was more than just a personal act, it was more than just a political act, it was also an aesthetic act as well. So I think that's a really interesting, interesting one. But uh, uh, just a, a person, uh, you know, I thought it was brilliant to, to bring together Lewis and Clark, Hobo Science, Simon and Garfunkel, Alan Ginsberg. <laughs> Um, my, my grandparents, um, you know, lived during the Great Depression. Uh, you know, this is a personal story. They couldn't figure out why, uh, they called them at the time hobos, okay? Uh, they couldn't figure out why they were always coming to their house. Well, it turns out my grandfather eventually found one of the so-called quote-unquote hobo signs, which basically said, these people give you a meal if you stop and knock on their door. <laughs> so uh, they, they figured out that there was this kind of uh, network uh, and this communication that, that uh, a lot of people just dismissed as graffiti, but actually were really like almost maps, uh, you know, stay away from this person, ask this person for food. Uh, it was kind of a, a fascinating a aspect of uh, that time period. Yeah. Thank you for your uh, comments and observations. Yeah, I I uh, um, I did uh, know about uh, Angel Island's graffiti and uh, um, also Japanese graffiti uh, in the uh, containment centers. So that is a whole different body of work. And uh, it is interesting that that has not uh, uh, been included uh, in the uh, handbooks of uh, popular culture when, when they do uh, sort of uh, chart out a history of American uh, graffiti. So, and uh, uh, yeah, about the homos, yeah. Um, their graffiti was used, it, it, is, uh, it was used as a, a form of like communitarian survivalism. And also, as you pointed out, map, uh, map making of social ecology, like uh, uh, which places uh, good. And uh, it was in direct uh, relation to the vagrancy laws that were implemented during that time. And, uh, uh, and what were the other things? Uh, I think that's all I said, and, and oh, okay. thank, thank, yeah, thank you for going into into both of those in in, in more detail. Uh, but yeah. yeah, I mean, it sounds like this is a a, a book waiting to be written uh, about <laughs> all the fascinating ways that, and all the different functions uh, that yeah. graffiti has uh, fulfilled o over the years. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question that really applies to um, Alan and. Uh, no, I'm sorry, to Daryl and Maddie. And so both of you, you talked about, in your case, Daryl, Disneyland and Disney World changing uh, and this iconic ride. And I, I know from, uh, I lived for a while in Orange County in Southern California that people are very possessive of, there's a certain you know, subset of Disney fans that are fanatics, truly love the place. And the same could be said, Maddie, about some Jane Austen readers. I mean, they're just, passion that she's they said you say Jane and, and they know who you're talking about did you see any uh, pushback in either case from those uh, fan groups whether they were readers in one case or uh, park attendees in the other when changes are made to something that they see as the the beloved whether it's the park or the novel um, maybe Derek go first Okay, yeah, uh, there was a lot of pushback when the uh, ride was changed because uh, people, it is that iconic scene. It's sort of the one scene that everyone knows. It's There was merchandise for it. And in that line, we want the redhead, uh, people would make their own merchandise with it. So their own t-shirts. So there was this pushback then, you know, oh, why are you changing this? Um, I mean, for some of those reasons that I suggested, you know, at the time there wouldn't have been a female pirate in charge. So why are you making this change? 
you're not being true to the time. When then some people, other fans would respond, well, no, at the time, you know, they wouldn't probably have gone in and raped the people anyway or sold them. So there's this pushback, some trying to use history saying, oh, you should be historically accurate and others saying, well, it's not historically accurate already. So what does it matter? Uh, and then people would also try to go back, oh, but Walt Disney says we should change with the times. So of course the ride should change. So there is this debate and there's still people who are still upset about it. You know, it's been what five, almost five years from the first change at uh, Disneyland Paris. And people are still like, no, it should be back to the original ride. Why did they change it? Of course, it's also been, I don't know how many years since Jack Sparrow was put in the ride and people still complain about that. Because it's like, no, that he shouldn't be there. So it's one of those things that people love it, people hate it. But then even the people who hate it still love the ride. So they don't care in some ways. It's just the Disney fan is kind of strange. Yeah, it's a unique person, right? Yeah. Um, okay, I'll, I'll give my take. When it comes to J Knights, okay, they have a special term, you know, when it comes to Jane Austen fans, J Knights, yes. Um, well, many years ago, so Eve Sitwick wrote something about, you know, Jane Austen's, you know, um, the sisters are so close together, and Eleanor and, and, and Mary Ann, in sensibility, they're, they sleep together, maybe there's some sort of homoerotic sentiment, you know, um, that kind of lesbian sentiment. So Jane Knights, you know, they complain a lot. But eventually these things, because of changing, you know, um, literary landscape, I, people have become a lot more accepting. And I'm going to share my screen with you. Okay, just give me one second. Okay, can you see my screen? Can you see my screen? Yeah, okay. Yes. So um, as you can see here, all of a sudden, you know, in 2009, a lot of interesting work suddenly appear. Um, so Ben W. Winters wrote this book, Sense and Sensibility and Sea Monsters. And of course, um, Seth Graham Smith wrote his Prime Prejudice and Zombies in the same year, so they all came out. And as you can see here, um, so you have another author, she's an American Russian writer. Um, she wrote all these series because of poverty, because of economic recession. So her house was mortgaged because of foreclosure. She said she had to produce these books. Men's Field Park and Mummies, No Vanguard Abbey and Angels and Dragons. Prime Praetors, um, um, Miss Darcy's Dreadful Secrets. And then you also have Regina Jeffers who wrote Miss Darcy, Vampire, Vampire Darcy's Desire, uh, Prime Prejudice, Adaptation, etc., etc. So um, as you can see, um, because these things can be popular, so you have a prequel, et cetera, et cetera. So people are becoming a lot more accepting than before. Um, and I, I think it's good development. Um, it's certainly, you know, helped boost the Austin franchise. So, so nobody's complaining anything about that. But the, when it comes to the very traditional Jane Austen uh, circle, like the... Um, Jane Austen Society of America, et cetera. And then of course, if you present all these uh, very radical ideas, people may raise their eyebrows a bit. <laughs> I would imagine. Thank you. Well, I do have a question for Daryl. Um, because um, you mentioned, you know, um, Disneyland, you know, all the all the representations of, of, uh, of the, uh, maybe the, the wife sale, the auction of women, et cetera, et cetera. That might be politically incorrect and that may be changed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when it comes to the culture of piracy, my impression is that it really highlights egalitarianism. So do, do you think Disney is actually not emphasizing the egalitarian, you know, pirate culture? Instead, it, it talks about, you know, um, the Hollywood agenda. So it, on one hand, you have this misogyny, patriarchal practice, you know, women are being sold in human trafficking. And on the other hand, you have girl power and then women can, you know, appropriate their sexuality in order to, to have more power, et cetera, et cetera. So why not, you know, give a better picture of piracy? You know, you have black pirates, you have female pirates and, um, you also have black slave trade, which is something that perhaps the, the, the right try to avoid mentioning that because it's such a sensitive issue. And you also have white slave trade. So um, what's your view on that? Well, I think it goes back to that uh, sentiment that they're trying to present this utopia. So they're trying to sort of hide all the negative aspects of society. Uh, so that's why they don't engage with these things. And then they don't want to glorify piracy too much. So like they, it's this fun ride 
And like, even with Jack Sparrow, it's this fun ride, but then they don't want to show the really, the really negative aspects of it. So it's like this weird tension that they don't want to show the negative aspect, but they don't want to glorify it too much. So they need to find that place in the middle where it's like, okay, they're doing these bad things. We acknowledge that, but they can still be fun. So it's this, it's a strange tension that, because Disney didn't want anything. He wants this to be a place like when uh, Walt Disney created Disneyland, it's a place for families to go. So they didn't want to do that. And uh, of course, during the fifties, it was the, uh, the boom in uh, the US for uh, tourism and money and the middle class. So, you know, egalitarianism really wouldn't fit in with this capitalistic boom that there was going on at the time. So maybe now they can try to put that in, but of course I'm Canadian, but you know, the news that I hear about the trying to change the views of their government systems, you know, that whole push for socialism and the pushback in it with some of the members of the government, I don't know how far that they would go to saying, you know, oh, piracy, they had this great egalitarian society because that's sort of contrary to what a lot of the people want in the political narrative. At least that's my impression from watching the news. I don't know. As I said, I'm not American, so I can't really comment about that. But that's what I seem to have seen recently. I'd be it's curious. Uh, you know, and it's I've, I've never seen it myself, but, you know, the, the pirate show at the, uh, uh, what's it called? Um, Treasure Island in, in Las Vegas. I think it has changed over the years, if I if I remember correctly, you know, that they, there's been, you know, an attempt to maybe, it's always been a family thing, but, you know, there's a sort of implied sexuality and implied violence and, uh, you know, that that might be sort of the next, uh, next stage in a book, right, the next chapter, uh, uh, this one would be not Disney, but Pirates, but, uh, you know, that show still continues and they still have a whole casino that's themed uh, around Pirates. All right. Yeah, uh, I think that show actually ended a couple of years ago. I could be wrong if my memory, like they sort of got rid of that. So it's still called Treasure Island, but they're moving away from the pirate aspect. But you're right, there is a lot of shows about pirates that sort of do glamorize it. There's uh, dinner theater shows, I think in Florida or, and also in California to sort of celebrate this. A lot of this is as a result of, you know, the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. So there is that love of piracy that people, as I said, they just love it. And I don't really know why, because again, for the longest time, these they were presented as these negative characters, but yet now everyone's, you know, so just like the vampire, you know, the vampire is supposed to be this dangerous figure, but then now it's sort of the love interest. So <laughs> it's that same idea, you know, the bad boy, the anti-hero. So we are about out of time, everybody. So unless there are any final comments, I want to thank you all for making this really a fascinating and enlightening group of papers. And it was really a pleasure to meet all of you and hear about your work. Uh, there will be a recording of this saved. And uh, I hope that everyone enjoys the rest of the evening. Take care. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks so much, Chris, for 